video diary. Uh, I think it's been a little while, but uh, today I've uh, I was uh, or the last couple of days I've been reading pieces on um, Sergei Eisenstein, the the filmmaker, and um, we had to watch his movie October, um, which is about the October seventeenth. Uh, uh, not October 17th, the October um, 1917 revolution in Russia. And um, I read this chapter on it, and I found it very compelling. Um, it, it started me thinking about um, we're going to move from Lenin to Eisenstein to Bong Joon-ho to poetry and propaganda. And um, I hope this all uh, makes sense in the end. Um, if it doesn't, I'm sorry. Um, I actually have some notes this time, so I'm not just going to be hopelessly rambling, you know, um, just a couple words, you know, but whatever. Uh, nobody's probably going to watch this anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. Um, but to start with Lenin, right? And I, I, I think um, you may be asking, well, why are we starting with Lenin? Well, because um, uh, because moving in Eisenstein, right, he, he has a similar idea of of art as as... as the effects that art could have on people, as Lenin does. But um, Lenin thought that that to to you know to achieve for the proletariat to achieve class consciousness, um, it had to come from the outside, right? The proletariat cannot view it. They had to have somebody come and show them, or have themselves be brought to a new awareness by moving outside of where they were to see. Um, class and then to become class consciousness and shed the false consciousness right of of, of like religion and nationalism and all those different things um, and then a, pr a true proletariat revolution a people's revolution could begin right and that's a obviously a simplification right um lenin wrote a lot and there are a lot uh the the whole thing has a complicated history but i am interested in not for that but for the way that it influenced eisenstein and, and uh, I'll tell you how Bong Joon-ho fits into this, too. Um, but I'm doing a lot of hand motions. It's exciting. Um, so Eisenstein, when he was making both Battleship Potemkin and, and October, but um, more Battleship Potemkin, right, was trying to reckon with this idea of, okay, um, his previous movies hadn't been... Um, the imagery that he thought was shocking and was shocking to the more upper-class people that watched it... Um, was not as shocking to the proletariat, to the working class people that watched the the movie, because um, his idea before then was that you could have a co if you had a certain effect in mind, then you could cause that change in the audience, right? Um, through cinema, right? Through the 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 techniques of cinema that were the experimental techniques that he was working with with cinema in the 1920s, right? And with cinema being a new, a fairly new art form at that time, about 25 years, I guess technically 30 years, 1895. Um, so um, Eisenstein uh, was, was, was trying to, to basically to force this effect, to change people's consciousness, to show them um, their uh, 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 a, a new awareness, a transcendent awareness of the world that they were living in, right? Which I think is what a lot of art, um, and, and I think I'm kind of giving up the, the, the game here, but what a lot of art is trying to do but in different ways, right? But so Eisenstein is working within the, the, the Soviet um, revolutionary mindset, right? Um, um, and I mean, it's... It, it, you know, this is only a couple years after the, the, the revolution itself, right? Um, and so a lot of these people are still alive. Um, and a lot of these things are still ongoing, right, at the time that he's making these things. Um, so Eisenstein is trying to, to, to um, he calls it the Kino Fist or the Cine Fist, right? Which is um, the through cinema, you can bash the skulls of the people until you can change their... Um, he equates um, film editing to brain editing, right? Which is really interesting and really interesting about what art can do. And I don't think he's entirely wrong, but I don't think he's entirely right either. Um, but that's kind of Eisenstein's kind of personality. He's very, um, uh, I don't know, he's very forceful in his kind of what he believes about what art can do. 
especially in the service of, 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 of revolution, right? Um, and there's something I think, for me at least, that's um, admirable about that. Admirable, not admiral, <laughs> admirable. Um, but to get back to Battleship Potemkin, right? And so there's this, this idea that, um, that through these use of, he, he called it uh, picture thinking, right? He can put all these pictures in a row and he can attach them to certain other things and he can make people kind of perceive what he wants to, um, per, them to perceive, right? But it doesn't quite work out that way. And, and, and I think actually to the betterment of his art, I think Battleship Potemkin is such a resonant film and such a classic film, um, not just for its historical value, but because of this picture thinking, right? Because some of these... Um, uh, images have this ambivalence to them that perhaps was not intended but is there in the art itself um, and he never quite gives a voice right that that Leonard would say might be necessary to come in and say okay here's what the propaganda is setting out to do right because Eisenstein was trying to make art right and art that would change people's minds right um, but whenever you start to play with metaphor and imagery and once again, I'm giving it up. I'm moving into poetry, right, when I'm talking about film. But um, that ambivalence creeps in, right? That ambivalence is inherent to um, the creation of art, right? And um, how Bong Joon-ho fits in all of this. Um, I was thinking about this in relation to his movie Parasite, right? Um, in that when Parasite came out, a lot of people were questioning, okay, well, is this truly like a... a a revolutionary movie, right? Is this movie actually calling um, into question these ideas? And for certain people, it, it because it didn't have that voice that came in and said, well, here's the propaganda, right? Here's the thing that I want you to learn, right? Um, it had that ambivalence um, that is similar to Eisenstein's film, you know, which was um, almost 100 years ago, right, by now. But they have that similar... Um, intense ambivalence to them that does not uh that that can kind of um creep in and make the the analysis of it that much more difficult but i think it's that much more important to the art i think parasite remains an artistic and, and beautiful and interesting film um because of the way that it reckons with um uh with this um ambivalence right and i think also the way that it reckons with what eisenstein calls concession and aggression with the past right that for eisenstein he's looking at this bourgeois kind of i um um russian um past right or not not just russian but western past right that is steeped in this kind of bourgeois these bourgeois ideals and bourgeois ideology and he's saying he's in some way he's um his films are a concession to that past and a concession to filmmaking that is not as um, revolutionary as um, he necessarily wants it to be. But in that way, he's also aggressive towards that past. And he's taking these um, bourgeois, this ideology, and he's using these kind of um, typical um, cinematic forms and he's using them to bash the audience, right? Um, and I think that, um, here's my cat. <laughs> um, I think that uh, Bong Joon Ho is doing something similar in that he's he's doing this concession to this kind of these these cinematic tropes, right? This is a thriller movie, right? Or this is a, a comedy that moves into a thriller movie, and he and he, he is also aggressive with that, right? The mixture of tones that is so much in this movie, and the ambivalence that is uh, so much of the imagery, right? Um, that the 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 I'm not going to spoil any of that film, but um, if you haven't seen it, go and watch it. And I think the way that connects to, to poetry, and for me it always comes back to poetry, is I think that, that ambivalence to me is what is so important to poetry, right? Because metaphor um, and, and all the forms of metaphor, synecdoche, um, um, uh, si um, simile, um, even, even just generalized imagery, all of these things have this ambivalence in poetry because they're navigating the personal versus the distance, right? The, the I in the poem is, is not the necessarily the poet, right? It's some speaker, but also to say that is some kind of, um, concession, right? It's not necessarily true, right? The I in the poem is still some form of the poet, right? Even if it's saying terrible, horrible things, right? The poet sat down and wrote that. And so there's this weird um, tension, right, in poetry. 
um, that I think is kind of explained by, um, not explained, but is it can be examined through the lens of Eisenstein and Bong Joon-ho and this movement towards um, art rather than propaganda, right? Um, which is this idea that there's this concession to the past, concession to um, form, concession to language even, right? But an aggression towards that, an uh, aggressive tendency to move towards ambivalence, to allow the reader to make up their own mind. And I think that's what great art does, right? Um, not that great art can't have this propagandistic edge, um, or it can't have some kind of didactic edge, even if it's not propagandistic, right? Um, but that it um, still, even with that, it still has this ambivalence, it still has this realm of interpretation, right? That is so necessary for art to flourish and for art to be a thing, right? Um, this, this fourth dimension, right, if we have um, depending on the, the nature of the medium, right? But for poetry, we have language and space and, um, and imagery, and then this fourth dimension, which is perhaps ambivalence, right? Um, you know, uh, language, space, the speaker, whatever you want to say, uh, are the three dimensions, and then the fourth one perhaps could, could be ambivalence. And I think great art always has this kind of ambivalence to it, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have points, or like I said before, that it doesn't have things it's tr trying to get across. But also there's room for interpretation, there's room for movement, there's room for grace, there's room for terror, there's room for all these different things that aren't quite, that you can't quite nail down in one um, kind of... Uh, uh, grand image, right? But is it a conglomeration of all these different things? Um, so I hope that made sense. It's kind of rambly, but I had some notes this time, so at least I was doing that. Um, probably nobody's gonna, you know, see this, but uh, I wanted to get it down for my own self. Uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, and it's nice to just kind of get these ideas out there, you know? Um, even if they're other nonsense, right? Maybe I'll come back to this and be like, wow, that was dumb. But at least it was there for me to think about and for me to contemplate for a little while. Um, all right. Talk to you later. Or not. <laughs>